Beats coverage of the American Le Mans Series is powered by Mazda 2. Follow your inner driver to the all new 2011 Mazda 2. It's Zoom Zoom, concentrated, and by Patron. I'm still impressed, continued to be impressed by the crowd as I walked back over to the television booth after my break, I looked over at Lanier Speedway and the entire parking lot is full over there. The crowd has turned out by the thousands. It's going to have to be a record crowd, I would assume. And oh, a problem for there. the 52, the LMP Challenge car up at the top of the hill. As you look at their overall leader, Frank Montigny flashes by. That's Montigny, a, Capello, and Verts. That's your top three. That is a blind area of the racetrack. It's not, oh, this is not a good position to be in. It's Luis Diaz. At all. I mean, that's exactly where Scott Sharp had that horrific crash. Last year, that's a blind brow of a hill. An now, interesting, Diaz climbed out. Now yes. he's climbing back in. I would do anything not to be where he's at right now. Well, I'm sure that he's covered by a waving yellow flag by the corner worker a little further down. But waving yellow flags don't stop cars. No, they just, it's no. an information. Diaz trying to refire the car. Remember, Luis Diaz, the defending champion in the LMP2 category. Now, this they, is a situation where he had a choice here to pull off the racetrack. I, there's no way I would stop that car where it's at. If it were me, I'd be off against that wall or as far from the track as I could. Oh, oh wow. a big stack up right here. Look at that. We talked about the GT2 oh, battle, and it this. is raging on as the Peugeots flash through. They're so, both of the ESM Ferraris, the Extreme Motorsports Ferraris, and down the front straight away again. And they Belander, came. Milner, Beretta, Magnuson, and Watch here this. they go up the hill into one. That's where Luis Diaz sits at the top of the hill. Well, maybe he's gone because I don't see any yet. No, he is not gone. He's still right there. And wow. I'm really surprised nothing, you know, that we haven't got a full yellow or something to get that out of there. And I'm sure that the officials looking very closely at that in conversation with the crew as well, saying, what is the problem if you don't tell us yes. yeah. very soon? We're going to have to bring this thing back under full course caution. Way too dangerous to keep right. Luis Diaz there and the car. There's, There's the waving yellow flag. I would, I mean, I would put my car in gear and bump the starter motor and get rolling because it's downhill. I mean, he can roll from where he's at if it's not locked up solid. And we're full course caution. Well, that's good. That's, that's a good, good decision. Diaz got back in the car and was trying to restart it. The other thing I didn't see him do, I'm not saying he didn't, I didn't see belts go back on. And you well, certainly don't want to be sitting there in that car without your belts on as you're trying to get it restarted. No. If you're going to be in it, if you're going to be in it, you certainly want to be belted in. Diaz in trying to get the car restarted. He's talking on the radio, I'm sure. I can see him shaking his head, talking to the crew, trying to figure out what the issue is. The scary thing for me was when he was out of the car, standing in the middle of the seat, standing up. You know, that's a oh. precarious, really bad situation to be in. And you can see the dirt offline just in front of the car to the left, and that just gives you an idea of well, where everybody's running and the amount of debris that's been pushed to the outside. And he had a decision here. I mean, he pulled the car to where it is. That, he stopped the car there, and I would no way put myself in harm's way like that. Seventh full course caution of the day as the safety crews arrive. Let's try to help Luis Diaz and get that car out of the way. The pace car will gather up the field and we'll go full course caution, as I said, for the seventh time from the 13th running of Petit Le Mans. Right now, the battle continues up front. Peugeot and Audi, and we expect to see it all the way to the checkered flag. Right now, give the nod to Frank Montigny. We'll be back to Petit Le Mans. Great shot from the helicopter over the Road Atlanta circuit. I said it's the 40th anniversary for Road Atlanta. 40 years this racetrack has been in its existence. Dorsey, I know you've spent a lot of time here. We've seen it change over the years. Predominantly, that 10A, 10B complex who used to come up. One of the most daunting turns in North America, I think, was uh, the dip and up underneath the bridge. I know you've raced here where you didn't make it past the dip. I had a, I was one of the guys that had the big one at the dip. Me and uh, three of my <laughs> closest friends at the time went on through the uh, guardrail into the creek there. Uh, I don't remember much of it. I woke up in the quack shack down there for the second time, and they didn't stop me this time. They said, you know where you are? I said, yes, I think I do. They said, you know what day it is? I said, I'm assuming it's a weekend. <laughs> the first right. pro race was here back in September of 1970. It was a real Can-Am, one of the very neat times in motorsports when the Can-Am was racing, and it was Porsche's first Can-Am win, Tony Dean, in the 908. And that, that engine in the 908, so small, it barely was legal to run. Peugeot here as well. It's a beautiful car, the old 908 was. That was back in my era when I started. 
So Peugeot's as well. Peugeot's came to pit road and made pit stops during that full course caution. Fuel only for both of the Peugeot's. The Audi did not come to pit road. Dindo Capello stayed out. Now pits open for GT cars as some of the leaders stay on the racetrack and I saw other cars diving to pit road. Interesting, Brian. This this is the time of the race really now where you really start to take the leash off, if you will. If guys are going to start making moves, we're getting close to that 70 percent time. That's going to come up here pretty soon where people in the in the championship hunt that need the points will get their points. Championship leaders in GT are in. Jörg Burstmeister climbs out. Chris? Yeah, lots of GT action down here. The Ray Hall Letterman BMW, the 92. First one in, first one out. The four vents right now, three leading the four out of pit lane. The 45 doing a driver change. Bergmeister out of that car. Mark Lee behind the wheel. They did tires and fuel. And now the two Ferraris, the 01 leading the 62 out. We saw Johannes Van Overbeck climb out of the 01. The cars head back to pit road. Bergmeister in the 45. This would be York Bergmeister's fifth American Le Mans Series championship. That would tie him with Beretta, the only two drivers who would have scored five championships. And York Bergmeister, I think, is very far from done. Certainly, Beretta wants to be far from done as well. But very impressive stuff when you think about five championships. Look at the sun. That's what I was about to tell you. This is the time of the day, and that's what I was uh, referring to before, where the sun becomes your enemy. Everybody with a clean windscreen right now, as they've just had service done to the cars. But as your windscreen gets dirty with the rubber marks and so forth and the sun straight on three times a lap in your eyes becomes really bad and you can see it on our onboards how bad it actually does get look at this wow that's into the braking zone for seven yep. very difficult visibility a man that would know about the visibility and the track conditions just climbed out of that 45 flying lizard porsche and that's york bergmeister yeah, and Jurg's wiping the sweat off right now. Yeah, having a great run out there. That 45 car running up front all day long. And we're getting very close to that 70%. When we get there, does that mean you guys are going to take the gloves off? Uh, not quite, though. Um, we have to finish in the top 10, actually, if the Ferrari wins or is in the top three. So uh, we still need to come to the finish line. So it's not quite that easy. As we're getting deep in this race, is it getting easier with traffic or is it getting harder? Uh, it's about the same then at the beginning. Uh, not really that many less cars than at the beginning. Uh, it's pretty warm in the car, so that's why I just did a short run and probably going to get back in at the end. And uh, yeah, car's good, just taking no risks. Early on, it looked like when we'd see tires come off the cars, not a lot of marbles on the tires. How is it now? Um, they just cleaned the, the track after that, uh, during that yellow, and um, not any problems with pickup, so there's no issues. Well, one of our championship contenders, their, uh, their race is definitely coming to plan here, guys. Mark Lieb straps back in. He's going to take his turn at the 45. Remember, the, Mark Leap has been with the Flying Lizards for years. He's in good hands here. They've put their championship in good hands. Remember, not only the American Le Mans Series, but also Patron GT3 action from here at Road Atlanta this weekend. Championships were to be decided the last race of the season. Round two of the Patron GT3 Challenge. Very different weather condition. Met the competitors and the fans on Friday for round two. And it was a good thing Enrique Cisneros in the 26th had clinched the Gold Cup Championship the day before because he had problems with Gary Pennington in the 50. And what about Ross Smith, who was our champion in the Platinum class and the race winner the day before? He had a problem as he cut down the right front tire. That handed the lead to Daryl Carlisle. A good run out in front. Problems for the Gold Class leader. Carlos Eduardo in the 24 has a dramatic spin into turn one, holds the radiator as well. But the class plows on through. It's Daryl Carlisle who holds on for the win in the Platinum class. Move back to gold. Kendall Smith in the number four in the Maxwell Paper Products Porsche. He claims the victory in the gold class. That is one happy competitor. And why would he not be the Patron GT3 Challenge? Competitive all season long. Congratulations to Ross Smith and Ricky Cisneros for their championships. We'll be back to Petit Le Mans. Car streaming out from underneath the bridge, waiting for the green flag. And it's going to wave, and we restart here at Road Atlanta. Petit Le Mans onto the front straightaway. One of the Risi Competizioni Ferraris drops a wheel. The 61, I believe. Jamie Melo behind the wheel. They've had their problems today with penalties doing what he can to hold on. And look at the prototype traffic streaming through as well. That's the one car, Simon Pagino behind the wheel. Lap 276 is what Highcroft is looking for. 252 in the books right now. 276 marks 70% of the total distance. And that's what they're looking for in order to clinch 
their championship. You heard Jörg Bergmeister say, yeah, we need 276, we need 70%. We need a top 10 finish as well. A little more cut and dried in the LMP category. Boys at Highcroft looking for lap 276. Jamie Melo works his way on through after dropping the wheel onto the front straightaway. He'll head down the back straightaway into good runs throughout, good battles throughout GT2 today. Well, Brian, it's really been a high crop day. You look at the problems that the Muscle Milk team has had. They had engine problems earlier, then contact later on. And then Dyson, that team, had the electrical issue. And then they've had to retire because of that transmission problems. But every time I check in with high crop, they say, hey, we've had no issues at all. It's been a relatively boring day for the team. The only thing that they did have to work around is at one point in time, early in this race, they asked David Brabham, hey, perhaps we need you to triple stint. You've been out there for two. We need you to go one more. He said, guys, I can't do it. So Rob Hill said, hey, David, you can always do it. What's the problem? He said, the crotch belt, it's just been too tight. I got to come in. <laughs> That's not funny. It, well, not <laughs> if you're in the car. It, it is a five or six point belt system in these cars, usually six. And that is a belt that crisscrosses underneath your rear end and then comes up between your legs and attaches into the lap belt. Shoulder belts tighten in as well. And so you are held in to this car. You literally can't move. And I can tell you from experience, if the belts are not right, it can be an uncomfortable experience, especially when you spend at least two sessions in the car. And certainly trying to do a triple um, makes it definitely uncomfortable, to say the least. It's Dindo Capello out in front. They elected not to pit that time, Dorsey. Both of the Peugeots did. They took fuel only, but Capello stayed out. Now, without taking tires on the Peugeots, their tires were warm as well under the yellow. Who's going to have more pickup? Dindo, who stayed out, or the Peugeots who came in, or will it be a draw? It could be a draw. You know, one thing, I, and I said it before, I, I complimented the uh, race workers here. Every time we get a caution, instead of just cleaning up whatever the caution incident is, they put that darn uh, that jet blower out there, and they clean this racetrack. And we've had a very clean racetrack. We haven't seen any pickup problems, and I think that's why. Montigny running second right now in the 08 Peugeot. Remember, he and Stefan Sarazan won this event last year. He is on a charge a 108.8 to Dindo Capello's 109.5 last time by. He's about eight and a half seconds oh. back. And a problem down yeah. in 10 in the heavy braking zone. That is one of the GT Challenge Porsches, the number 28 right now. Having a problem in that braking zone, Lauren Beggs behind the wheel. He'll be stuck there, but they do have that extrication uh, crane over there where they'll pull him out. That'll probably just be a local caution. Look at this. Trouble. Got a new kind of push scooter, an expensive one. Now, I do that at the grocery store when I'm in a hurry On to get cart? my cart back out to the car. I've never seen it done with a prototype. That is the number 52. They've got a problem. That car obviously going to be hit, taken back behind the wall. Lauren Beggs with his problem sharing that car. With Doug Barron and Rene Villeneuve this weekend, and we're full course caution yet again here. With the pace that the Peugeots have been running and the Audis have been running, we thought that we could be on record pace, but we also knew coming in that with 45 entries, the, pro the chances for issues and problems and full course cautions would certainly be there. Take a look down into the braking zone. Just going to be Looking a for the 28. He's by himself. Ooh, he well, lost it. Control. And I'll tell you what. It was bad, but it could have been a whole <laughs> lot worse. If he had headed for the apex and released the brake, headed for the apex, there were cars already there, and that would have been a catastrophe. So Lauren Beggs made a mistake, but at least he uh, mitigated the circumstances. He ends up in the gravel, and uh, while he may be embarrassed, he certainly did the right thing, chose to release the brake and go right instead of heading for the apex. So a good job by Lauren Beggs. That brings out the full course caution as the crew will work to extricate him from the gravel trap there at the end of the back straightaway. Looks like BMW drivers getting ready to get in. We'll be back to Petit Le Mans. Welcome back to Petit Le Mans, powered by Mazda 2. And we talked about the weather and the crowd and the competition. It has all come together for a spectacular event here. The season finale for the 2010 American Le Mans Series. Don't forget the Intercontinental Le Mans Cup. This is round two for that as well. So some bragging rights and points at stake for the Intercontinental Le Mans Cup as well. Peugeot and Audi battling that out. I know Drayson Racing involved is that as well. Oak Racing, good to see that team from Europe over here running this weekend, Jacques Nicolet who actually owns the rights to the Courage chassis or uh, the Pescarolo chassis. Um, is, a, is a constructor and in running in the Intercontinental Le Mans Cup, not only as a team, but uh, also as a manufacturer as well. So this, this event 
now a part of that Intercontinental Le Mans Cup, has truly become international. Here's a look at the three races on the schedule for the Intercontinental Cup this season. Silverstone, which was already run, Peugeot beat Audi. Audi qualified 1-2 there, but had a rare mechanical problem, and then the handling just went away on the remaining Audi. Peugeot finished 1-2. Petit Le Mans here today, and then Zhuhai China on November 5th and 7th. Last year, seven rounds of the Intercontinental Cup, so that'll be even more intense, the battles, and the great thing is, Sebring and Petit a part of those seven events. Well, we talk about GT2 and how good the battle has been. There are new teams this year. Next year, Scott Atherton is going to tell us we even expect even more growth in the American Le Mans series. We had two, I think, very significant announcements. We have a brand new Lamborghini team coming into GT2, as if that wasn't diversified and competitive enough. But West Racing will be joining us with two Lamborghini Gallardos with Yokohama tires uh, on board with a, a full full program, professional drivers. Um, you know, they're being very modest about what their expectations are, but I can assure you these guys are going to play for keeps. Riley has been involved with the American Moss Series many years ago. They have not been active in recent times, so this is great news. You know, they. Uh, they are a top flight, world class technology company that for us is an ideal addition because it's all American. So the American Le Mans series presented by Tequila Patron with an American based prototype, that's all good. All good indeed. Great to see two new cars in the GT category, but uh, Bill Riley and Bob Riley talking about bringing a prototype in, that's even bigger news, I think, Chris. Yeah, Brian, and one thing associated with that Riley announcement this weekend is a, is a pretty hot rumor in the paddock that Scott Tucker looking to possibly move up into P2 next year with those Riley cars. But the one thing he's really looking for is possibly Ferrari coming on as a manufacturer engine provider for P2. Scott Tucker is all things Ferrari. He <laughs> raced in the Ferrari Challenge, won his second SCCA National Championship this year in a Ferrari. That's right, Dorsey, I knew you were going to guess that. Sponsored by Ferrari dealerships and uh, is a part of the Ferrari family, so to speak. He's had an opportunity to test cars that very few people get to drive. I'm sure Fisichella has gotten to drive some uh -huh. of the, the 500 series Ferraris that uh, Scott Tucker has been invited to test as well. But it takes a, a, a driver of the caliber of a Ferrari uh, factory driver to get into some of these vehicles and do some of the testing. But they've invited Scott Tucker from time to time. So not surprising at all to see that he would want to try to get a Ferrari power plant in the back of that Riley chassis in P2 next year. It's going to be perfect for that because P2 is going to be one professional driver and an amateur driver as well. Well, while it takes chassis and engines, it also takes tires as well. And Justin Bell has more on our Michelin Tire Tech piece. Absolutely, Brian. Well, there are two rule books in play here, really. You've got the American Le Mans rules and the Intercontinental Cup rules. Now, here in America, you're actually allowed to have two guns and four crew, which probably means a pit stop takes a tire change takes about 10 seconds an amazingly quick time whereas over in Europe where you're allowed one gun and two guys helping you the pit stops can actually take up to 25 28 seconds now obviously that affects strategy quite intensely even Michelin find themselves in the races going double triple sometimes quadruple stints on the tires because they can they're well known for that whereas over here we tend to find we do many more uh, tire changes now it is the American rules that dominate at Petit Le Mans. So you've got four guys, two guns, and those very, very quick tire changes. They will, and all the Michelin teams you'll see are doing it, are actually changing tires very frequently, which plays into the strategy. They just don't want the kind of pickup that the Road Atlanta track can, can offer. So the rules in play here are the American ones, and uh, Michelin are rising to the challenge. Guys? Play on my playground, play on, play by my rules. And the great thing about that is the pit stops don't take long. The tire changes don't take long. You can run a softer compound, Dorsey, because you don't plan to leave it on the car quite so long. Well, you're going to run a softer compound very shortly because the sun's going down. We're going to lose our temperature. And then everyone will switch over to softs. But you're only allowed so many sets of softs. And uh, the smart guys will have saved those for tonight. I know that a couple of cars did, in fact, start on soft tires. And uh, I think they were allowed a maximum of five sets of those. Well, we started with an absolutely beautiful day at the beginning when the green flag fell. The temperatures were probably in the mid to high 60s. Temperatures on track, definitely warmer than that because the battle up front was hot from the very beginning. It was Alan McNish 
on the charge, sweeping around the outside of Frank Montagny down through the S's, and he was on it on cold tires, willing to press really hard, but Montagny says, no, I'm not having anything to do with that. Takes it back from McNish down in the 10A heavy braking zone. Then problems for the six. Yeah, trouble with the Porsche. It a misfire in the engine. They worked very hard on that throughout the day, trying to get that to run on all, all of its cylinders, but no avail early on. And of course, it ran into trouble later on in the race. So disappointing for Greg Pickett and his team. But then take a look at this. Tony Vlander makes contact with David Murray. Murray goes for the first of several rides that he would have today. Vlander comes to the pits for a penalty, as will Dirk Mueller for that move in his BMW Shane on Shane Lewis. Lewis. Yeah, Shane Lewis gets put off there. Both those guys had to come in for a stop and hold 60 second for avoidable contact. And then after Mueller came in and did the pit stop, handed over to Joey Hand, the car would not restart. Had a problem with the starter, tried to fix it on pit lane, but eventually the 90 would have to go back to the garage to be worked on. It's found its way back to the racetrack. But look at this, the seven past the 08. It was McNish again on a charge. He loves this racetrack. He says, it suits me because you got to charge. And charge, that's exactly what Lauderer was doing in his Audi when he got wide and went over the curb. Didn't suit him quite so much. Pressing as hard as McNish caused a big problem, Dorsey. Big Ejected, problem. no doubt. Here's the other incident with the six car. Made contact, and one of the spokes of the wheel actually went in, got hooked up in suspension. They got that fixed and back out again. That was Sasha Mossen. Some days it just doesn't pay. And uh, for here, the, it didn't pay for the Peugeot, as Dindo Capello said, no, the apex is mine. If you're going to make up your mind to pass me, you better make it up sooner than that. I'm going for the apex. We had cha championships on the line coming into this weekend. Gunnar Jeanette, Scott Tucker were absolutely tied until this. Heartbreak here is the power steering rack fails on this car. There's a very high load uh, racetrack, and unfortunately, that killed their championship. Jeanette had to take it behind the wall, but the battle certainly continued on the racetrack and certainly in GT2 as you watch the Corvettes doing battle, the three past the four, and then problems from Mark Wilkins. Something definitely broke in the back of that car in the braking zone halfway through. Wilkins on a wild ride out of the car, talking to the medical guys, and he'll take a ride in the wrecker to return the 55 back to the level five motorsports tent. That's why Scott Tucker, all season long, has shown up with two cars at two sets of drivers. He's able to drive each one because now Tucker is in a good position for his championship. Only 16 laps to go before we get to 70%. You heard green, 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 and big puffs of smoke out of the Peugeots as we saw him come back to green. There is the familiar yellow roll bar on the seven. Dendo Capello out in front as he leads the field up the hill. And this is where visibility this time of day is going to become an issue up into the braking zone for three and the braking zone for five and seven. And all three of those very important brake zones, you cannot see a thing headed up those hills because you're climbing elevation. You're looking straight on into the sun. Through five and uphill climb, then down through a little valley. The very fast turn six right hander with a little bit of banking. And then the slowest corner on the racetrack, turn seven onto the long back straightaway into the sun again. Understand the 17 on pit road for a penalty. Martin Raginger behind the wheel of the Porsche from Team Falcon Tire. Stop and go penalty for speeding on pit lane. A lot of penalties on the pit lane today. Not no, for if, this group, if everybody. They, if they char charged them like 75 bucks for every penalty they got, they'd be making <laughs> some money. Take a look at this charges on and right now Capello in a good place because he's got the sister car with Benoit Trulier behind him. Trulier right now not fighting for position but he's oh. doing a good job of holding the Peugeot back a little bit. Benoit Trulier. Got a real good look at the Peugeot with the amount of uh, exhaust coming out of it that time. A discussion point all day about how hard they're running that engine. They've got to turn way up. And the good thing is the more that Montagny has to fight, and Gertz has to fight to get past the other Audi, the more Dindo Capello can pull away. Why well, you have team cars, isn't it? That's exactly <laughs> why. And I can tell you, Trillier will not be easy to get past as Capello tries to work his way through six, seven, and onto the back straightaway. Well, Dorsey, you mentioned that diesel soot coming out of the Peugeot again, and really this stems from the beginning of the year. Peugeot taking a look at what Audi was doing with the R15 Plus, and they were anticipating Audi coming to Le Mans really a lot stronger than they actually did. So the team said, hey, we've got to do a lot of L engine development leading up to Le Mans. And we saw one of the problems with that engine development is the connecting rod failures at Le Mans. They didn't validate those connecting rods, and that's why they failed. But also, a lot of other improvements to 
to that car, so that's why we're seeing that smoke and also the engine tone. They improved the combustion, they reduced the exhaust pressure, they really increased the amount of air flowing through that motor, and that's another area where they picked up horsepower and torque. I can tell you, Dindo Capello needs to get on the horse because right now the three cars behind him are faster than he is, and we heard Tom Christensen say when he got out of the car, I had that vibration. I wonder if it's gone away for Capello. So let's take a look. Trillier trying to hold him back and look. Montagny trying to get to the inside. Wheel to wheel, left front to uh, right rear. And once again, you have to be careful. You have to weigh and look at this. He got it. 08. Montagny gets past, and you wonder if Capello didn't have some type of a problem because he was well out in front, and that was quite a leap for Montagny to get there in that short of time. Does. Capello have some type of a problem. Now, the other cars behind him were a, a second faster. I just think it, uh, that the, the Peugeots on an outright. Dindo, box this lap, box this lap, we're ready. They say, Dindo, box this lap. Capello does have some type of a problem. He'll be coming to pit road. So the question is, what is the issue with the seven? Is the vibration still there? As Capello flashes out of 10B and heads straight to the pits. It was talking about not being able to see. Now, I don't know if that's the sun or what we've talked about before with the vibration being so bad that you couldn't see the corner. This will cost them dearly, and they need to get whatever service done and get him back out there at the pace that Montigny and Verts are running. Justin. As Dindo came up the pit lane, he was shaking his head towards Allen. Allen literally put his helmet on in about 30 seconds. Now, we'd like to think that perhaps this is as simple as some pickup Dorsey that's on a tire. Maybe they got something from inconsistent. That would cause him not be able to see if he has the sort of vibrations that can come through at the, at the speeds and the load that these prototypes have. Um, the other thing is the other thing is with uh, Alan getting in the car is you know he is like the Scottish ninja and maybe they know they've got to respond to the Peugeot speed they wouldn't have come in for track position obviously but remember there are what quite a few hours left in this race and Alan is capable of a very fast double stint triple stint maybe that was a very clean pit stop and um, they changed tires I believe it is something to do with the tires will obviously time will tell now if Alan has the same problem well, this is what I don't understand. It must be something with the tires. Dindo had a dark visor. McNish has a clear visor. So I don't think it's sunshine or the brightness of the sky that's creating the issue. We'll have to find out. Let's take a look. You see right now, Capello working his way into turn five, backs up a little bit to try to get a run, and then just loses space coming off of turn five. That is exactly where, where you look straight into the sun, though, as you climb that hill. And then it was an easy run for Montigny to drive past as well. And you see Trillier stand, stay behind him to try to defend a little bit to the other Peugeot. Now McNish back on the circuit. But questions remain from Audi. McNish through six into seven. Bright sunshine in his eyes right there. Through seven down the back straightaway. The question is, how much time did he lose how far around the circuit are the Peugeots? That definitely hurt. Green flag stops here at the pace these guys are running will set you way, way back. We talked about the visibility, Dorsey, and uh, if you have the sunshine and that vibration that TK had talked about earlier, that makes it even worse. Here come the Peugeots and look at the traffic in front as Montigny in the 0A tries to work his way onto the front straightaway. Trillier hanging onto the back, but remember he is not for position. So it's 08, 07. And then the seven of McNish. Let's go back to GT, GT2. Great battle here. 92 and three, the lead in GT2. Right now in the 92, it's Tommy Milner, Olivier Beretta in the Corvette. Working the draft, coming up the straightaway, long, long back straightaway here. Watch for the pop auto. We're gonna have a, a LMBC car in the middle of this mess too. Beretta looks to the inside, drives by, I was gonna say easily. Milner didn't make it too easy, but got the position and will take the lead. The problem was that 35, the Oak Racing entry, the P2 car, Frederick DeRocca behind the wheel right now, looked like he was gonna come as well. Got a little dicey down into the braking zone, but Beretta takes over the point. Yeah, I think, you know, I think that this visibility issue is gonna be there for another half hour or so. 
guys just have to back up and break a little earlier, a little lighter in the areas where that sun's right in your face. It's quite possibly the boys in the Peugeot have it a little bit better in that enclosed car, a little bit of a windscreen at the top. But as you said, Dorsey, it's only going to get worse as the sun continues to get lower in the sky. The laps continue to count down. Highcroft looking for lap 276. That'll mark the 70% mark. We're going to stay with you all the way to the checkered flags because what we care about, the overall winner, as you, I'm sure you do as well. The 13th running of Petit Le Mans continues from Road Atlanta. We'll be back right after this. Watching the field stream through turn six and seven just gives you an idea of just how tight turn seven is here at Road Atlanta onto the back straightaway. Action continues at Petit Le Mans, and it is just as we thought it would be. It has been exciting in every class from the drop of the green championships. Well, some of them look a little more clear. We've seen Gunner Jeanette and that uh, Green Earth Team Gunner program have problems with their steering rack, and that looks really good for St Scott Tucker in the LMP Challenge category. For the overall win, it is tight, as tight as it can be. Frank Montigny continues to lead right now in his Peugeot over Alexander Burtz. Then Alan McNish has climbed on board the seven after Capello was out for a very short period of time, had a problem on the racetrack, and then came right back in. Talking about not having good visibility, and I saw the dark visor on his helmet, so I don't know that it was sun. Guys, we talked to, well, we understand we've got Dindo Capello now available to us down in the pits. Yes, we do. Dindo, I saw you coming down the pit lane, shaking your head like crazy. You were flying out there, and suddenly, boom, it was as though someone turned out the lights, and they did, right, almost. I thought to be in a nightmare because what happened, I think, uh, it was, was just crazy. I felt that the helmet start to move every breaking point and put my balaclava on my eye and every breaking point, it gets worse and worse. I have to take the helmet up with one hand and now we just see that the eject device, which is inside, it moves, it went in one side and uh, that is, I think, is just crazy. It's really, I don't know, I, I have no word to, 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 to describe my feeling. You've had a long, successful career. You're leading the, the Petit Le Mans race at the time, pushing, pushing hard, and you lose the visibility like that. Is it? It's a very hard decision to come in the pits, but no choice. Uh, at one stage, I told uh, my engineer, I, I wait still one lap, and then at the asses, I break it again. I get blind, and I said, no, I come in immediately. It was, was it? I tell you, it was a nightmare, really. Well, we were speculating. I'm glad that, that the truth is as simple as it sounded. Great run, though. Well, that's interesting. You said the eject device. Now, the eject device is, uh, goes in the helmet, and it's actually just a little inflatable bladder that sits up at the top of the helmet. In a case of an accident, the safety crew can inject air into that, and it will actually lift the helmet off the driver's head without the medical crew pulling up on the helmet to risk any damage to any type of cervical injury that might be there. So strange that that would move inside his helmet and begin to cause his helmet to I guess not fit correctly, and therefore his helmet to move on his head. Well, it sounds like the balaclava that he wears, the fireproof face mask, was probably somehow hooked into that uh, that extraction device, and it, every time he'd get on the brakes, then the balaclava would go over his eyes, and he was not able to see anything. And Dorsey, I mean, I'm, I've experienced it like you have. When you are in a GT-style car, you have a little bit more luxury with and the Peugeot drivers would to lift their visor and, and rearrange stuff, even at the speeds they're going. In an open top cockpit car, you have no option with the wind buffeting that's going on. And just to show the incredible G-forces, imagine how much those helmets are moving under braking. And, you know, we've had discomfort. David Brabham could run for, you know, as long as he could with uh, groin altering belts. But when you can't <laughs> see, you know, it just shows your eyes are more important than, you know, the others. <laughs> So one thing you can't do without is, is visibility. You've got to be able to see the race car and where it is on the racetrack. And guys, we're approaching the 70% mark, four, four laps to go. But remember, that's just the 70% mark for the overall leader. These class guys who are looking to get to 70%, they have to do 70% themselves. So they've got a few more laps to get under their belt, even if these guys hit lap 276. I don't like, this. I don't like the sound of that, that crotch belt situation. Only Justin can, uh... I, 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 you know, I'm thinking that some of the time in some of the traffic I've seen, maybe having your eyes closed probably wouldn't be so bad. But uh, right now, McNish back underway. But... Not only was it costly to come to the pits, they were not ready for that pit stop, and you could tell it was a little bit uh, 
of a circus type act and uh, a very non routine Audi pit stop at McNish now back underway. And uh, you look at it, he's still off the pace of the Pujos right now. He ran a 112 flat to the 109s. Well, there we go, into the 109s. So now getting up to speed. The key for McNish, I think he's going to really last storm and drive that. Remember the rules state seven hours max or a maximum of four in a six hour period. He got into the car about 3.30, 3.40 to go. So he can take this car to the checkered flag. And if he gets into a rhythm and starts really laying some laps down, don't count Al out Alan McNish. 273 laps in the books for Frank Montagny. Just three laps to go before we get to 70% of the event for the overall leader and McNish is certainly be on a charge and perhaps that 13 flat that I saw is just indicative of what traffic does here. We've seen it earlier in the day three to four seconds yeah. depending on where you catch it. But I can tell you from now on McNish is not going to be nearly as cautious as I think he was earlier in the day. He realizes how hard he's going to have to charge to get up there and not do battle with just one but two Pujos and he really doesn't have a wingman anymore. Oh, that one extra pit stop that they had to make because of Dindo's inability to be able to see is very costly, no question about it. I mean, he'll be trying to run that deficit down, but that's easier said than done. Montagny going past the 45, the Flying Lizard Porsche. Remember, Jörg Bergmeister, Patrick Long trying to clinch a championship there, a driver's championship, but also the manufacturer's championship for st is at stake. We can't lose sight of that. Tommy Milner running second in the BMW right now out of the Ray Hall Letterman stable. That looks good for the BMW in the Manufacturers Championship. And Dorsey, you and I talked in the uh, qualifying show, Manufacturers Championship are important to these drivers because that's where their paycheck comes from. Yeah, it's much more important than the individual driver championship because you're a factory paid driver and your, your job is to win the championship for the manufacturer. If you so happen to be able to win a driver's championship along the way, well, that's fine. But the number one priority is the championship for manufacturers. But remember, for these guys, the 45 car, yes, they have to have the pace, but also they've got to keep their eye on the big picture. They want that driver's championship first. They get that once they get to 70%. Then they can chase after the team and the manufacturer. Maybe they've got anything left in that car, they're going to show it. As Jörg Bergmeister said, 70% is what we need, but we also need a top 10 finish. So you got to look through the rest of the GT2 category. I think that's going to be relatively easy for them to take care of today. But you never know one problem and it can all end. We've seen it earlier today. We saw it from Mark Bookins. Still don't know what the problem was on that car as he came into the braking zone, but it can end just that fast. Absolutely can end. I mean, this is a tough race. Right? Look, speaking of which, eight. look at here. This is a simple spin there. This racetrack, because of the elevation of turn 12 and turn one, it really compresses suspension really hard. It's brutal on the left side suspension. Take a look at what happened here. We've had a lot of problems at this time. We're all top of the hill. A couple cars got together. Well, there's a yellow car behind the black and purple Whoa, Porsche. Look at I this. Look at the Porsche. Oh, that geez, was barely close. got through. And the BMW. They split that car while it was still not even done spinning yet. I wonder if the Corvette gets into the back of them. Let's take a look. This is coming into turn three. I think they do get together. Uh, yeah, he yeah, does. Definitely. He well, turned he, him. Well, I think the three car but watch there. this. Watch this. Holy cow. Now, that's an unavoidable contact. I, I wouldn't be a bit surprised if we get a penalty yeah, off that. Yeah, but that was the leader in the GT2 right. class, Olivier Beretta, and I think he went to go to the outside and saw that Peugeot there, Dorsey, and had to check up and just didn't get enough done. So that would be a tough call to bring Plus, him in for that one. And, and once again, you're going right into the sun at that point in time. You could just have been blinded by the light. He didn't have the option of flicking to the outside and going around there with the Peugeot coming at him. The two of you are giving me the driver's side excuses. <laughs> <laughs> I should write a song. <laughs> sure, you have a long list of them. It's under review right now. Shane Lewis back underway. He's got to feel a little beat up today. He first got pipped by Dirk Mueller, and now one of the Corvettes has gotten into the back of him. And right now, Frank Montagny flashes across the line. Burns as well. 276 laps in the book. 70%. Petit Lamar is down for the leaders. Different scenarios of the different classes. It gives you an idea of what the sun is like. See Mark Lieb as you ride on board the 45 Porsche. So the one this car Pagano currently driving it, and they need six more laps to clinch that championship here today. And when we think about Bergmeister and Pat Long, they need 27 more laps on the board to make sure they get to that mark. Anytime these cars head into the west, you said it, Dorsey, it's turn three, turn five, and especially turn, turn seven. seven. Sure. That sun is right in your eyes, and it, it, it's still, it's only going to get worse for the next 20 minutes as the sun moves lower and lower it, and lower. It five's really a bad one because you're headed up the hill, so there's no way to duck it. You can't put your head down like you can in the other corners and get away from that sun. 
Get back to that lead battle. We talk about McNish potentially finishing this race out and driving almost four hours here in his final stint. He's going to be in a rhythm, Dorsey. The Peugeot guys are going to change drivers. And if it does start to change the light, the track conditions change, it's going to take them a little bit of a time to adjust. Particularly when you go into the night vision, the first time you go in the car and you have to adapt to being in the dark. Well, for Allen, if he stays in, he'll adapt as the sun goes down. He'll be really good by then. But if you go out from, you know, this first time out in complete dark racetrack, it takes you two or three laps to get any kind of a, a good feel about it whatsoever. Well, as the sun continues to go down, the laps continue to tick away here. The 13th running of Petit Le Mans. But don't forget that available for 2010 is the American Le Mans Series iPhone app available for free in the iTunes store. You can have series news, video scoring, and more sent directly to your iPhone. Check out AmericanLeMans.com today and look for the iPhone icon. Calvin has one on his. I think Frank Montagny continues to lead overall. A little more excitement at Petit Le Mans. Andrea Robertson in the number 40, the Ford GT. Problem off into the tire barrier, but it's like not a lot of damage to the car, able to get it refired and back on track. And most importantly, uh, well, I was going to say it didn't bring out a full course caution, but indeed it has. But she's back underway and she wasn't in there for long. So I wonder if it, indeed it was for the 40 or if there's another problem on track somewhere. It kind of looked like the uh, tire wall exit, uh, turn one tire wall. You see a lot of damage to the nose area and a broken windshield. Broken windshield, no mirror on the left hand side of yeah, that car. That's a pretty good hit. Andrea Roberts is saying the steering wheel straight, but then it snaps out on me. Yeah, she got problems. Got suspension problem there. Dick Barber, you know, so successful, six championships to his credit. And unfortunately, they do a great job with these cars, but this one uh, I think is going to take some time to fix. I can tell you the job that they did on the 04 in building it was absolutely spectacular. They took their time and they did it right. And uh, David and Andrea Robertson. Remember how proud they were here last year when David Murray qualified that 40 car on pole and David did uh, such a professional job took off led a few laps and as the Dunlop tires went away a little bit and the, the big factory guys started to press a little bit he, he actually pulled over between five and six off the line a little bit and let him go and said all right I've done that we can do and uh, I've shown that what this team can do. Well, this team has really worked hard because they've been through the wars a little bit. Remember, they had a big crash at Most Sport where Dirk Mueller tried to go inside Andrea in turn nine and took the car off there. They've had a couple other big ones this year. So Steph Chisel and the whole crew, they've done a tremendous job to keep this car on the racetrack. And in the meantime, building up that second car, which looks really superb with a fit and finish and everything they've done around that, ra that race car. And each time uh, that car got crashed, instead of just fixing it, they improved on it. They, they've changed things to make it better. Well, now we see the Peugeot going around Andrea at a speed. I guess uh, there have been approval to go around, even though it's under caution. There you see McNish, the yellow hoop on the Audi. Left front, that car. Left front wheel on, on the 4 GT looks like it's got some positive camber, so I think it's probably done some suspension damage. I don't think. Yeah, look at it. I can see it pretty clearly there. I don't think the pace car picked up the leader. I think yeah, he picked up the other Peugeot. So this is going to take some sorting out. And what's going to happen is then is that Audi will try and somehow get Alan McNish back on this lead lap. So here we sit again. Now they've let the Peugeot go. Unless he. And sure pits are open whether he dived in. a lap down right now. Yeah. So it'll take a little while to get this sorted out. The pits so, are not open, yeah, so, they've so they've been waved, waved around. Yeah, they waved Burt's around. Actually, what we're hearing is that uh, they were trying to wave by the 40 car, and the Peugeot's went, well, thank you, uh, we'll, we'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you have to pick up the overall leader initially, and that has not been done yet, right. so... I would think that Verts is okay and the rest of these boys will be going by as well. So, but meanwhile, they're going to have to really shuffle through the whole pack to find Montagny yeah. who leads this race. Yeah, there's the that's zero seven. The that's straight. Alexander Verts that's right there. That's Vertz, the seven. Yeah. Remember the seven with the dark mirrors, the blue mirrors, the 08 has the white mirrors on the front of it. Once again, you just saw the jet dryer out there cleaning the racetrack. He's so. just coming through one. Yeah. Yeah. So this is going to take a while. 
but the problem is now it used to be a lot easier to actually get your laps back because they would then wave around to find the next overall leader so it allowed McNeese to do but what they then do up now Dorsey is pick up the next class leader so it gets very complicated particularly when we've got the split pit rule on prototypes yep. coming in first then the uh, GT car so it's not as easy to play the strategy to get back on that lead lap immediately 283 laps in the book for Montigny and I'll slide down to fifth place overall Simon Pagano 275 laps in the books and they're working 276 so as he comes back around this time across his line will be 276 laps in the book for Simon Pagano I'll tell you what a great run as well as you look down it's Montagny Verts, Alan McNish then Ben Devlin in the 37 car the Intersport car remember Devlin one of the three drivers for Dyson who won this event in P2 category last year it was Butch Leitzinger Marino Franchitti and Ben Devlin Devlin hasn't driven the car much. In fact, he works for John and Clint Field in their restaurant business. It hasn't been doing a lot of racing. John said the other day, I know he's a little bit frustrated, but I told him if he's going to work and he's going to have a career, he's got to work. When he works well, we'll let him drive. And so they let him drive <laughs> here good this incentive. weekend. And uh, Ben is one of those guys I really feel that hopefully will not slip through the neck he's got a lot of talent. He thought he's going to be a full-time driver with Dyson Racing last year. Just got the long-distance races, one petite, and then has really been put on the shelf this year. And now we see that wave around. They're looking for the lead Peugeot, and they've just got to sort this situation out. A lot of the American Le Mans Series stewards get things sorted out behind the pace car here at Petit Le Mans. We'll take an opportunity to take a quick break, and you can as well. We'll be back to more action from Petit Le Mans and Road Atlanta. The sun is going down, but the season, it ain't over yet. Right on board the number 99 with Gunnar Jeanette. Here. Right, and don't forget that Wednesdays on Speed, it's Intersections. And at 10 p.m., Stealth Rider, right here on Speed, only on Speed. If you want excitement, make sure you're there on Wednesday nights. 99 Gunner Jeanette into the sun, now into the shade down the back straightaway, <laughs> waving to the crowd. And they were well back. You know, we were talking, once the 55 had problems of level five, we expected the 99 to immediately put Gunnar Jeanette or Elton Julian back in the car and try to work forward because anything could happen and the 95 was the only level five car still out there but they've gotten the 55 back on the racetrack that's pretty impressive during that break we talked about lap 276 how important it was listen to a little radio communication from Highcroft <laughs> Not that they were prepared or anything, Dunk were they, Justin? No, of course they were. Duncan, normally it's bad luck to prematurely celebrate a win, but there's no doubt about it here. Brilliant job, mate. Yeah, no, it's just a real testament to all these guys on the team who've worked so hard and the fantastic drivers, the great engineering, everybody on the team. Uh, it was our goal at the beginning of the year not to be one and done and to try to repeat as champions and this is the best crew in the in the in the planet as far as i'm concerned and, and we've got the best driver core and you know i really have very little to do with it it's uh it's the guys who work in this team and have such uh, a sense of passion about what we do so it's really gratifying to, to get the second one and of course it's such a big event like this with such huge teams here in attendance it really is showcasing the team's talents the driver's talents and capabilities on a world stage so this is no mean achievement is it well no it's great it's been a long day obviously we wanted to just try to keep it uh, keep our noses clean throughout the race and now that uh, we've achieved 70 percent and won the championship we're going to try to go uh, hunt down the field car and see if we can uh, maybe one of these other p1 cars will drop out and we can get on the podium overall so we'll have to see how it goes we have been noticing and talking about, and I was chatting with Simon earlier at lunch, I said, you know, how do you keep that pace up but not go too fast? How do you monitor it? And I know as a driver, it's sometimes most dangerous when you back it off. You're better to push. And he had fastest laps, and David had fastest laps, so your guys are doing an incredible job. Yeah, I mean, we talked about it earlier before the start of the race, and, and uh, we didn't want to get out of a rhythm. You know, we try to win every race. Not always are successful in that endeavor, but but certainly to, to push hard and, and to keep uh, keep going after it, and that's what they did. And, and uh, it's uh, proved out with uh, this poster here today. So we're pretty. It, it is a brilliant job. And guys, can you imagine what this poster will say by this time next year? Duncan <laughs> Dayton is an unstoppable man with his team, and he's very modest to say I didn't have anything to do with it. He's the one that leads that team. He's the one who's put it together. Don't forget, Duncan Dayton has two Petit Le Mans wins 
as a driver himself, but a little strategy going on in the Peugeot cab. Well, I think so. We saw one of the Peugeots on pit lane, and I think what Audi would have hoped that both those guys hit pit lane, which would have allowed Alan McNeese to maybe get back on the lead lap, but they only pitted the 08, Frank Montagny, and they didn't pit the other one. So I think they may have learned a few of the tricks of the trade around this place by now. It's very fascinating indeed. Stuff. It keeps one car there, it puts one car back. Now they're on different strategies. They can cover the Audi yep. here or there, depending on what happens throughout the race and how the race unfolds. And like you said, it would have been great to see both of those Peugeot slide out of the way. McNish could have scurried back around and at least been on the lap. He would have been way back around on the lap, but he would have been on the same lap if another full course caution would have come out. That would have helped his position. But Peugeot trying to make sure they've got all of their bases covered right now. Pace car has the next class leader. That looks like the 89, or the 95, I should say. So they have it. Uh, well, the next leader is going to be that the, Peugeot. Yeah, they'll have to do the wave be by the back to the Peugeot, leader, yeah. Which then keeps McNish behind him, so he can't get that lap back. Is the 89 right now that is behind the pace car. He will be waved by. 89 has Kyle Marcelli behind the wheel and very impressive job. We talked about Kyle Marcelli earlier. Duncan Dave was just about talking about hoping to catch the 37 car. It looks like John it's Field natural, Brian. having problems right now. So this bring team back, had run guys, so well. Just talking about Dip Ben Devlin, the job that he had done. This team running so well, fourth overall right now. But now John Field sounds like some type of a problem with the gearbox. I heard him say it's in neutral. Back. Listening in on the radio communication, I heard something about differential. I think they did a driver change. Ben Devlin has jumped out. I believe that is John in the car, and Justin's right there. What's going on, Justin? I was standing right by the car as you tried to get out, and it is John Field in the car. The, it will start, guys, and then as soon as he engages gear, it just dies out. So he's right there in the back, and uh, we'll have to follow this story with all these GT cars coming in, but John's got a, a problem here. Uh, the BMW has a bit of a problem as you look at the, how they have to get the car into their pit spot because of the problems for the 37. So the 37 sticking out a bit as the 92 comes in. It's Tommy Milner behind the wheel, third as he came to pit road and rolled to his stop. So they'll work on this car. It'll be tires and fuel and a driver change. And watch these BMWs. They are actually, really actually flying actually in the pits this year. It's not a driver change, actually. What they've had to do with the way the regulations is, they did it also on the 90 a minute ago. They, the Tom actually had to put his helmet on in order to recharge and swap out the drinks bottle. Oh, the driver so has to do it, so that was the thing. So you get all dressed up, no disco to go to. Oh, so they're making the drivers actually do more than drive today. They're earning their paycheck. You see the 45 flashback out. Jörg Bergmeister still behind the wheel of the Flying Lizard entry as he heads back on track. Mark Lieb had come in and gotten out of the car. Now it's Bergmeister as he heads out into the sun. And this is what we were talking about earlier. Very difficult. You've been sitting in the pits. It's been a couple of hours since you've been in the car. And the first thing that you're greeted with as you head up the hill into turn three is that bright, bright sunshine directly in your face. The nice thing is it's under caution, though, so it will allow you time to adjust just a little bit. Obviously, at speed, it's a totally different ball game. But if you get thrown out there in green conditions and you're suddenly getting that blinding sun, it is very, very difficult to deal with. Field will sort out after pit, pit stops, but it was Beretta, then Jimmy Bruni, Tommy Milner, Yen Magnuson as we came in. So as you look, it went Corvette, Ferrari, BMW, Corvette, and then Ferrari. So great to see Corvette up there. Again, Beretta holding down the point. This Corvette team needs this to end the season with a win, and not just a win, but a win at Petit Le Mans as they move into 2011 season really give them some high hopes. If they leave this season without a win, you got to wonder what that morale on that team is going to be like. they got a long time to build it back up before Sebring, but you know they're going to be down. Well, I spoke to Doug Feehan, the program manager here with Corvette a couple of races ago. I said, are you going to roll the dice a little bit, get more aggressive the strategy and trying to really, you know, force your way into one of these victories? And he said, no, well, we have a long-term goal, and I'm sure everyone else out there is saying, why haven't you won? You need to do it now. This is a long-range plan. They intend to be here for at least three more seasons. So, you know, they've got an objective. They've changed to this production-based motor this year, the 5.5 liter. That's caused some drivability issues earlier in the season. They've been working on that. And they're just refining this car. Ollie Gavin said we're going to do a lot of off-season testing this year. We're just going to get it right. They're going to come out the box strong next year. They've really learned where the benchmark is. Well, they have a different engine builder now. K-Tech had been building all of their GT1 power plants and had 
built the first several of the power plants for the GT2 car, but that has now changed. So, uh, you know, there's a lot to build in this new program. I think the big question mark next year is what will the performance in the new Ferrari be? They're going to have a direct injection engine, we understand. We understand the 458 should be a lot stronger. So that is the concern. Yes, we know what the benchmark is now, the standard is now, but is that Ferrari going to up the game? Big things on tap for 2011. We heard Scott Atherton talk about a new prototype, Bill Riley coming in. We also heard him talk about two Lamborghinis in the GT category. All of that is exciting stuff. Man, if your windshield is as dirty as the lens on our camera, you're not gonna be able to see a thing. The other thing is, if you've been in the car for a while, did you sit down in the car when you started your stint with a dark visor on? Because in just about 15 to 20 minutes, the sun will be down, and then visibility is gonna be very difficult as you look at on right on board the 95, the level five entry. Looks like Marco Werner. Marco Werner, that is. Three-time Le Mans winner, so much success. And this really is a testimony to what Scott Tucker has done this year. He has just thrown everything but the kitchen sink at Lyon, trying to win this championship. He's got two former Le Mans winners on his driving squad this weekend. Two excellent drivers in Mark Wilkins and Bert Frizzell to assist. So he's really loaded the bear up. And before Andy Wallace moved over to help Paul Genelosi with his team, that was another Le Mans winner that Scott Tucker had. You mentioned Mark Wilkins. He is back behind the wheel of the number 55 car. They did do the repair work on that. We reported earlier that Mark said it felt like I, I put my foot all the way down. I had no brakes. It felt like I lost all the brakes. That is correct. They believe they had a brake line failure, which caused the rotor to explode, but the crew worked hard and got him back out. So they still have those two bullets in the gun. And I did get confirmation. Scott Tucker has done at least 50 laps in both of the cars, so he can score points in both of them. Well, that 55 car is still shown in third spot, so they're still ahead of the 99 car, so that's great news for Scott Tucker. Potentially get another podium finish with that car as well if they continue to run. Podium finish is important, but the championship green, green, is more green, green. so, and you hear green, green, green. As you saw Alan McNish flash by, Marcel Fazler in the nine car just pulled over and let him go so he can give pursuit. Alan is going to have the hammer down right now. He has to get around that Peugeot and get back on this lead lap. Great strategy by Persia. We talk about learning the ropes. They have really learned the ALMS style of racing with multiple pace car situations, dealing with things, and that was a great move by keeping one of the cars out there and not allowing McNish back on that lead lap under caution. Oh, and there's something, it's taillights that are dangling from the 07 car of Alexander Verts right on the right rear. I saw the brake light assembly hanging down. You can see it's missing there from the right side. Look at McNish. Dangling off the back end of that car as he came off of turn five. So I don't know if that's gone. a curb. I think it may have gone now. Don't see the light dangling anymore, so it may have been torn off going through. No, there now it is there. again. Now the question is, how long will the officials let a car run with something? I don't know how substantial that light assembly is, but if it runs out there and comes off, that could do significant damage. And for Alan McNish and an open cockpit car behind him, that's a serious safety issue. Absolutely. They'll observe this probably for one more lap and then maybe make that call. But Alan McNish needs to get the hammer down. He needs to get around this Peugeot. Then if there was a yellow, he would then get back to the tail end of this lead lap. That is massive. Up into turn three, you see the assembly out the back of the 07 car. It's Alexander Burtz, your overall leader, Frank Montagne. Listed as second, McNish shown in third, a lap down. McNish hounding, matching him move for move. There is no one more magic at this racetrack, I believe, than Alan McNish. Remember a couple of years ago, the crash on the warm-up lap. Two laps down, they started that event, and McNish, the drive, really, of his career, I would say, to come back, and he told the crew, if you fix it, I will win. And that's exactly what happened. That was magic. I could never forget watching Piro rush through the crowd, clearing the way, clearing the waves and the throngs of crowd around that tend to get Allen back to pit lane, two laps down, and they took it to the checkered flag in first place that night. And what a move he put on Christian Kling late in the event, right here, down in the break zone for turn 10A. Like Vert's able to pull just a little bit that time, but McNish sights firmly set on the car in front. He needs to stay close enough, Bryce, so when they start to hit traffic, then maybe he can uh, the, pounce. The assembly just fell off, and Alan McNish just ran over it, so obviously it is now gone. But the concern is, if I'm Pujo, that the other lights stay because you are required to have working tail lights and brake lights. You see the le oh, left side, the only assembly still. Uh, sitting there on the back end of this Peugeot 908. 
Allen's going to do everything he has. He's really going to wring the neck of this Audi right here to try and close up, be close enough. We know what a difference traffic can make. Sometimes three, four seconds a lap. We've seen him do it already today. Take advantage of that traffic. If he can get around and get on that lead lap, that is a game changer potentially. And Verts at 36, still a young man, but uh, talk about a young man in success. Still the youngest overall winner at Le Mans when he won there with Davy Jones and Manuel Reuter. Impressive man, and when we talked to him at Le Mans and as well, he said, I, I love this. I remember testing the Formula One car and seeing the Peugeot testing one day and said, I must drive that car. I must drive that car. Down the front straightaway, good battle up front. McNish doing what he can, but the battle in GT, GT2, just as good. Jimmy Bruni stays up front, and then Johnny O'Connell, Jan Magnussen, second and third, and look at this being held up through turn seven right there. Bruni gets balked. Can the Corvettes get a run? Little freight train action. It's the 17 car having the problem. Martin Raginger just a little off the pace in turn seven. Think about the dynamic here. You've got the two ex-Corvette teammates now going head to head. Johnny O'Connell, Jan Magnussen, been teammates for many years on the Corvette squad. They got split just two races ago. Now they're competing against each other. Johnny wants this one back. He's on, bad. He's on his home turf here. Lives just a couple of miles down the road. It's been a lean spell for Johnny O'Connell and the three car. They did score the only G22 victory of the Corvette squad at Mosport just over a year ago. But it has been a long, winless season for Corvette. When we talk about the championship here and that Patrick Long, York Bergmeister kind of sitting in the catbird seat there, but the manufacturer's championship up for grabs in GT2 as well. And a little bit earlier, it looked like BMW had the upper hand as the 92 was running well up front. But just recently, Milner beginning to drop back a little bit. He's now back at sixth. The 45 Flying Lizard Porsche, as you see him flash through right there with the yellow window banner, now in front of the BMW. And that's the way the Manufacturers Championship would turn if it were to end that way. You're looking at it right there. You see the Flying Lizard car coming down in turn six. There's the BMW. And that is all about the championship of both team and manufacturers between those two cars right now. Uh, this is how it all went down. We've seen this earlier today. Traffic, could it be a part of it? You ride on board. The Flying Lizard Porsche. Your bird nice just sliced to the inside there and took the position away, going down into turn 12. Looked almost easy. For a moment, I thought it was another class car off the pace. And looks to me like Milner beginning to drop back a little bit. Dirk Werner actually behind the wheel of the 92, I should say. Yeah, he didn't get a good run there. There was traffic up ahead, so I'm not sure whether he was balked somewhat, lost his momentum, but have to wait and see. Think he'll settle down, get back into a rhythm. Maybe he'd gone offline, got some rubber pickup on his tires. Can be a number of things that will affect your lap time. Well, Werner having to adapt to the conditions right now because there was a driver change on that most recent stop. So perhaps it's just going to take him a while to come to grips, literally, with not only the track conditions, but the lighting conditions that we've talked about as well. It did look easy, though. I mean, York just flashed the inside. He didn't even think about it. It's not like he had to feel out the situation. So you'd have to assume that Werner was way off the pace there. Hey guys, I've been listening to the Ray Hall Letterman group and they've been telling Dirk that the pressures are good. You've got to go. You've got to go now. So I think what they've been seeing is just waiting for those pressures to come up once we went back to green. And now they're telling them, hey, you got to pull the trigger. You can't lose these guys. Well, this is what we've been talking about. McNish needs to get around that Peugeot and he may need traffic to help him. Traffic is getting thick for Alexander Wurtz right now. We've said it all day long from the drop of the green that traffic and traffic density was going to be an issue. When we remember talking to Tom Christensen just the other day, and he said, we're going to be passing three or four or five cars every single lap out here. Now that we've looked at the differential between the lap times from the different classes, it's going to be busy. And right now, Alan Nish gets bottled up just a little bit. Kyle Marcelli does a great job, lets him go. And now more traffic in front of them. And don't forget, these are fast cars. This is your lead pack in GT2. One thing that they've been really working really hard on now, McNish gets a good run through turn one, but it's very tough to pass up there. How forceful will he be? Well, he needs to hit him and take out the left rear tail light. <laughs> <laughs> Not hard, just enough to break the lens, and then it all works his way. More traffic in front. This is the GT2 leader. Yeah, and back to the setup on the Audi. Tom Christensen told us we had a pretty good balance last weekend, but once we got into traffic when all the cars were on the racetrack during the practice sessions, we found a real inconsistency with how the handling was affected in traffic. 
Oh, look at him close up right there on the back of Burtz into seven. Can he get a run? Remember, McNish has already nailed one of these Peugeots in the gearbox once today down into turn one in the early going, so he's not afraid to mix it up. I don't think afraid is in Alan McNish's dictionary. Down into the braking zone. McNish is going to have to go with him, and he does. Slides inside the BMW. McNish holding on to the back of that Peugeot as they slice through traffic. Well, you've got to be decisive. You've got to make your mark. You've got to let that slower traffic know that you are there. You don't want to be halfway alongside. Get all the way alongside, then get hard on the brakes. We've make seen sure that. he knows. We've seen that multiple times today, Calvin, and you're exactly right. You've got to be decisive. If you're going to do it, do it. McNish. This is great stuff. I mean, this has been a fascinating battle. We saw the smile on Tom Christensen's face when he got out of that race car as he went and had a great deal for a couple of hours with Mark Genet. And now we see two of the other factory di drivers duking it out. We heard Dr. Wolfgang Ulrich say, we're here to win. Anything other than winning is losing. But they're here to race. And that's the thing. And that's the emotion you saw on Tom Christensen's face. These guys. They love to win, but they like to take it. They don't want to have it given to them. They want to race. Well, Audi have won this race nine times in a row from 2000 all the way to 2008. And last year, they really felt they were in the catbird seat. McNish made a very rare error. We had that deluge. And under caution, he spun the car around. The Peugeot's whipped around him. We, n we never saw green flag action the rest of the day when the race was called. So they let one slip through their fingers there. McNish would love to redeem himself here this afternoon. And he's going to give everything he has. But this is really the last time we'll have a chance to see these two race cars go head to head here on US soil. They have one more race in the Intercontinental Cup over in China, of course. But this is the last time. There's new rules in place for next year. Both Peugeot and Audi have brand new race cars on the drawing board. Well, we talked about the Manufacturers Championship in GT2, and we concentrated on Porsche and BMW because when they came in, they were separated by only one point. We also talked about the swan song for the Ferrari F430. Well, guess what? Jörg Bergmeister in fifth, Dirk Werner in sixth. The Ferrari is in first in GT2. And guess who goes to the top of the Manufacturers Championship where it's in this way? It would indeed be Ferrari. And there's probably no better swan song than just for Ricci Competizione and Giuseppe Ricci to see a Ferrari not only win this race, but to walk away with the Manufacturers Championship as well. We've said all along, it ain't over till it's over. This GT Manufacturers Championship it's going to go down to the wire. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is great stuff. You've got a Ferrari currently running in first and fourth. First Porsche is fifth. First BMW is sixth. So Ferrari have a lot of momentum right now. They've won the last two Formula One Grand Prix. They're looking strong there for the F1 World Championship. Alonso's back in it. There'd be nothing that Giuseppe Risi would like more than to give them the manufacturer's title. The driver's championship, well, that's almost out of reach. Once we see Jörg Bergmeister do another seven laps, he and Pat Long will have that tied up and eliminate Jimmy Bruni. Well, I was speaking with those that duo earlier in the weekend, and they said, you know, it is an advantage to have only two drivers because you don't have to share the practice time with the third driver, but you compromise for that because you have to run longer since you have more time behind the wheel, so it wears you out. And another thing that those two are not doing they're not running a cool suit. The reason is that with a cool suit, the ice in the box only lasts about three hours. So they would have to change the ice. They don't want to lose that time in pit lane. And the last thing that they want is for the, uh, that ice to melt and to have the warm water going through their suit. So what they're doing instead, they ran a helmet blower. So there is no duo in the field right now that's more happy that the sun is going down. Yes, yeah, certainly that makes a dramatic difference to the cockpit temperature. But for Alexander Wurtz, who leads this race, he's got 15 laps less fuel on board than McNish. He's probably going to be needing to be hitting pit lane pretty soon, you would think. For Jimmy Bruni, he said, if we don't win the championship, we didn't lose it here. We've made mistakes along the way. But if you want to keep up with the American Le Mans series, visit the ALMS photo gallery on AmericanLeMans.com. Photos from every day of every event. If pictures say a thousand words, we have an essay for you. So visit the online photo gallery at AmericanLeMans.com for photos from Petit Le Mans and all the other American Le Mans series events. Battles continue to rage all around the road Atlanta circuit. And look at this, the BMW, the 92 of Dirk Werner, followed very closely by the 45, Jörg Bergmeister. This has championship implications for the Manufacturers Championship, and especially as long as the Ferrari stays up front. So right now, that's the way it is in the GT2 category, except for the fact that Yen Magnussen has taken over the point from Jimmy Bruni. Fantastic battles throughout the GT category. And here we see it coming down into 10A and B. 
York Bergmeister behind the wheel. He just needs a handful of laps now to clinch that driver's championship, but he's in the thick of a race right now. And Magnussen on point in the G22 category, so BMW and Porsche keep swapping back and forth in the for, or the Corvettes, they are on a march to the front. Yen Magnussen taking over the point from Jimmy Bruni. Johnny O'Connell sits third in his Corvette. Right now, McNish, you see him go through the picture right now. He's got back on the lead lap. Verts pitted from the lead. Now turned the car over to Anthony Davidson. And that has put McNish back on the lead lap. Some 50 seconds now behind Montani in the OA. But he's a little bit out of sequence. He has the least amount of fuel on board of the three leaders. The Peugeots have much more fuel on board than Alan McNish. Jan Magnussen in the four. The BMW in front of him is not for position. That is the 90 who had their problems earlier on with the starter back on track now. So that is not for position. But you look behind that yellow Corvette. You do see the 62, the beautiful red Ferrari from Risi Competizioni. Jimmy Bruni trying to hold on. They want to take a victory here in this final event. They'd like to give Ferrari not only a win, but the Manufacturers Championship on the exit from American Le Mans Series competition here in 2010. But Corvette desperately needs it as well. And for Yen Magnussen, if he could hold on for a victory, he'd become the only American Le Mans Series driver to win a race in all 12 seasons of American Le Mans Series competition. It's his last opportunity to do so. Magnussen down the inside of the BMW. Well, he just laid down the fastest lap of his race, and then the car's fastest lap of the race at 120.5, just five laps to go. So he is absolutely in that sweet spot. The car's working well. Conditions are starting to cool down a little bit. Magnussen on the charge and takes it to the front. You just saw him get around Dirk Mueller in the number 90. Talked about the problems earlier. Jimmy Bruni still giving chase. And we thought that the Ferrari had a little more top speed than the Corvettes. We'd watched the passes being made several times throughout the event. Ferrari on Corvette down into 10A. But Magnussen has gotten the best of Jimmy Bruni somewhere around this very challenging racetrack and has pulled out a little bit of a gap. And at, when we look at those points as of now in the GT Manufacturers uh, chase, Ferrari had it when Jimmy was up front. And I think with him dropped back to second, that's going to change things and shake things up again. So this Manufacturers chase is going to go right down the, to the wire today between Ferrari, who really have the outside shot, up against BMW and Porsche. It's Frank Montagny who leads overall. Alan McNish second, then Anthony Davidson. That is your top three. Peugeot, Audi, Peugeot. Simon Pagano runs fourth. And they have been turned loose. They've gotten to 276. Their championship is wrapped up, and they are going to be going for it. John Field, with his problems, has dropped to fifth. Leader in LMP Challenge category is going to be Marco Werner. Scott Tucker's championship looking better there. One more lap for York Bergmeister, and he and Pat Long wrap up the GT2 oh. Driver Championship. Look how tight this is. Certainly through some of these slower corners, the mechanical grip of the GT cars may be equal to those prototypes. They really develop their grip at higher speeds when the downforce is coming into play. I think Magnussen may have gotten into the back of the 08 just a little bit, or the 07, I should say, just a little bit there. Coming through 10B, maybe a little bump on the way off the corner. Certainly was very close, couldn't quite tell first glance whether he did touch him or not but it was certainly very very close and uh, just shows how hard Magnussen is pushing he's not wearing that there's a Persian in front of him let's get on the gas boys let's go see the 08 Frank Montigny behind the wheel as he slices through the inside goes down the inside of Johnny Cocker into turn six and into turn seven and look at the shade in turn seven now that bright sunshine gone from the driver's eyes as they enter that braking zone into seven that is going to be a relief from here to the checkered flag much more relaxed time. But the thing that's important, I think we talked about this earlier, the drivers that are in the car, they need to stay in the car. Their eyes can adapt as they as they stay out there on the racetrack and the light becomes dimmer and dimmer. You don't want to put a guy in the very end who the last time was in was in bright sunshine. Well, we talked about that GT championship and how it may have changed with Jimmy Bruni losing the lead. There we see it. Ferrari <laughs> now drops to second and BMW go to the top. So wow, it may not be in... It may not be BMW and Porsche to really control this. It may be between the Corvettes and the Ferraris and how they duke out the rest of the way. Absolutely. There was a great article in Road Track Magazine this week about the GT category in the American Le Mans series. It describes five of the cars very, very well. It talks about what a great series it is, and it really is a, a showcase for the manufacturers to take product basically off the showroom floor, massage it, modify it a little bit within a very tight framework of rules, and bring it to the racetrack and run it. You see the Ferraris battling with the Corvettes, battling with the Porsches and the BMWs. Premium marks, premium brands, all doing battle in the American Le Mans series. As the sun goes down, temperature cools down as well, and I would assume the track temperature doing the same, Jamie. 
It is, and quite drastically, actually. Just checked in with the Michelin tire engineer, and she told me that in the last hour, the track temperature has already dropped nearly 10 degrees, so it's falling fast, and it's just going to keep going down as we get in closer tonight. Why that is critical, a lot of these cars have different options in terms of tire compounds, and once the track temperature gets to a certain threshold where it drops low enough, it may allow some of these teams to go from maybe a hard to a medium, or a medium to a soft tire. Be right on board with Mike Rockefeller. That is in the GT Hybrid, that Porsche 911 Hybrid, running 18th overall. Just uh, if it was in the GT2 category, it would be 8th, but it sits between 7th, Amica Salo, 8th, Anthony Lazaro. So right in there with those guys, 274 laps in the books. Remember, that car led the Nürburgring 24-hour race for eight hours and then only finally had an engine failure uh, just about, what, 22 hours in, a little more than 22 hours in. Nothing to do with the hybrid system. It was actually the very reliable Porsche power plant back that had the issue. And it's just been impressive to see what tomorrow may look like as you see this technology racing here today. Yeah, it really is remarkable and certainly has shown a lot of potential here and it's a lot of fun for these drivers to really work with this hybrid system in terms of the acceleration coming off these corners under braking is storing that kinetic energy turning it into electrical power which is then delivered to the front wheels mike rockenfeller behind the wheel they've got all of the winning drivers from audi driving this hybrid car here this weekend you know when we talked about tire problems earlier i talked to the michelin uh, guys in my break and they said you know what we've changed compounds on that car we were running just a standard compound because we haven't come up with one yet we've got to really develop a tire for that because dorsey and you and i were talking about it earlier that front tire not only has to steer this car it has to apply power as well and that is a very different construction need so as this car develops as hybrid technology develops and the sanctioning bodies begin to embrace it and it runs in competition the tire development will go with that and just like everything else we see that tire development will find its way to the street and also this car is relatively heavy with all these extra components on for the hybrid system i'm sure they'll put that on a diet and get some of that weight off the race car but right now it's a lot heavier than the regular gt2 machine so the drivers were feeling that certainly under braking into the corners and that's going to stress the heavily loaded left side here and that's what we're seeing with the left front issues earlier in the race just the flywheel system itself weighs several hundred pounds as you watch the battle in GT2 for the lead, continuing just as it was when we left it. Jan Magnussen out in front in his number four Corvette, the 62 of Jimmy Bruni right behind him. And he really closes in turn five. You see him gain some speed. Seems like the exit of some of these corners, the Ferrari just a little bit better at either putting the power down or at low end torque coming off the corner. You wouldn't expect that out of a Ferrari versus a Corvette, no. but it's what we see. You really do. I mean, particularly coming off the chicane, I was watching Scott Sharp earlier in this race when he was duking it out, and he really closed up on the Corvette as he accelerates underneath the bridge. Down the back straightaway. We saw this earlier, able to get a little bit of a draft. This time, Rooney not close enough to get it done, not close enough to mount a charge, and it really doesn't look like he closes much. Do you think that the draft on these cars is important? You probably need to be within four to five car lengths at the most to start to feel it. And you need to be at that three to four or five car lengths back at the beginning of the straightaway so you can hang there and take advantage of that draft down at the end. You're not going to get a lot, but you will get two or three miles an hour, and it does make a difference. As you see the 37 flash by, John Field behind the wheel. They've gotten those problems sorted out on the Intersport entry field, now running fourth overall. And that's great because they've put together a tremendous performance here with he and his son and Ben Devlin. McNish is in, so he's out of gas. Not literally himself, but certainly the car is, so topping him up with diesel. 81 liters versus the 90 liters go, that go into the regular P1 machines. And it's all about the amount of energy. How far will the car go on the fuel capacity? And that's really been equalized over the last few seasons since we've seen this diesel technology come on board. Doesn't look like they're gonna change tires. They've got them set out and the guys are there, but they're certainly in no hurry. They're not poised by those, those axles ready to change tires. Should be just under 30 seconds to get that full full load in. And away he goes, staying on the same tires. So double stint, no problem. Can they go any further? It'll be interesting to see too, when they decide to change compounds. A few years ago, Michelin literally had a compound for every 15 degree weather change, every 15 degree temperature change, I should say. And as the temperature falls, they'll, they'll find a tire that works in that sweet spot. Question is gonna be 84 laps to go. I'm not sure whether McNish can do it on just one more stop for fuel. They've been running right around the 40 to 45 lap mark. So he can potentially now get to the checkered flag here tonight with just one more stop and maybe 
maybe then they'll go to some soft tires, but I think they're going to need a break. I think they're going to need a caution here during these last couple of hours to really have a chance of uh, chasing down those Peugeots. Seven and a half hours almost in the book. Seven hours, 28 minutes in the book. So we still have quite a ways to go. Drivers' Championship beginning to become a little more clear now in GT2 now that the 45 has reached the 70% mark. Patrick Long out of the 45. Chris is there. Well, Patrick Long is casually watching our broadcast and also looking at timing and scoring. And even though we're past the 70% mark, you guys don't feel like you're out of the woods yet. No, there's still 15 cars running in GT2. We want this manufactured team championship, but for the drivers' championship, we need to do the 70% mark, but we also got to finish 10th or better. With 13 cars still running, mathematically, we're not out of the woods yet. So uh, just kind of a split decision there with the, the two other championships and obviously getting to the end. But I think we have some for him toward the end, as I said earlier, um, but not sure if we have anything for those first two. Really, if we finish in front of the BMW in the top 10, I think we're pretty good on uh, manufacture. So. Uh, Still a lot of math going on down here, but I'm just getting ready to get back into my stint and uh, just drive the wheels off of it and let the statisticians figure out the rest of it. Now, air temp and track temp have come down quite a bit. They're going to continue to look, go down. How's the, how's the Porsche react to that? Well, uh, so far, our tire wear has been pretty good. So we've been running really hard all the way through the heat of the day. Uh, we've heard through the grapevine that some of the other manufacturers might be struggling a little bit with that. So we see that they might be, you know, turning it up as the sun goes down, which isn't good for us. But in the end, we're having a good time. Uh, if we get this championship, the, the, the competition this year has been so stiff. And we didn't come into this year thinking that we were a favorite. So if we can pull this off, it's going to be the most rewarding and the sweetest one yet. So uh, hopefully number four for Jurgi and I tonight. Calvin, I checked in with quite a few of the GT teams down here on this tire situation as the temps are coming down. And just about all of them are saying that they're probably going to stick with the medium compound because the soft compound at this racetrack just doesn't last long enough. This track, so you only get about 12, 15 laps out of it. So most of them are saying that they're going to stick with the medium even as the temperature continues to go down. Well, that's interesting, Chris, and I think because of the pace of the race, we're not getting so deep into the nighttime hours, and that's going to have an effect on the tire compound choice as well. What a great battle we're seeing here at the front of the pack. Magnuson continues to lead, being chased by Jimmy Bruni. He'll have got the word that we're past that 276 mark in terms of laps, so certainly the Lizards have completed 70% to score points here today, but as Pat Long pointed out, to get points, you've got to be in the top 10 to get one point for 10th, and then the 10 bonus points that you get for this extraordinary race, 1,000 miles or 10 hours. Magnuson still continues to lead over Jimmy Bruni, Dominic Farnbacher. You've got to be impressed with the Ferraris this weekend, Calvin. Remember, in qualifying, it was 1, 2, 3, 4, I believe. And uh, Extreme Speed Motorsports, we talked about how they've come along. But as you look forward to next year, it's going to be a brand new Ferrari. It'll be interesting to see if they can come out with a package right out of the box that was as good as the 430 has turned out to be. Well, I think the expectations are certainly high. And I know the competition is very concerned because the bar has been set this year. We see great competition. But if Ferrari can suddenly come out of the box next year with a better race car, that's going to have everyone scrambling because I don't think Corvette are going to do that much development. Certainly Porsche have said they've got not much on the plate. So we'll have to wait and see. Wow, it's a real ebb and flow. When they come off of seven, Bruni does get a little jump, closes in on Magnuson. Right in the middle of the straightaway, Mag seems to pull out a little bit. And then Bruni just not close enough in the breaking zone to get it done. Another good drive off of 10B, closes the gap again. But ebb and flow, but now we've got traffic in front, a slower GT2 car, and the 23, one of the GT Challenge cars, as Magnuson approaches turn one, he's going to have to deal with traffic. Yes, he is. And all of the leaders in GT2 are essentially on the same fuel strategy. They last pitted on lap 260, and those guys are around 284. So 24 laps into this stint, they're about two thirds of the way through. And then it's down to the teams. How efficient can you be on pit lane? Do you roll the dice? Do you double stint these tires in the late going and try and gain some time on the pit lane? And now a little bit of breathing room for Magnuson as he splits with the 40 car in between he and Jimmy Bruni. A little breathing room, at least for now, but still a long way to go from here at Petit Le Mans. There's a good look at the top five. You know, we talk about the Ferrari and that Ferrari F430. Giuseppe Risi and his Risi Competizione team. It has been a joy to see the competition here in the American Le Mans series. The 62, Jamie Melo, the entire team, the Endurance Kings, they call them. It was Sebring, it was Petit Le Mans. 
Sebring, it was Lamar, it was back and forth. They were the Endurance Kings, six wins in a row. The big ones, they took them all. And the celebrations continued. They'd like to end the Ferrari F430's run in the American Le Mans series with another victory from here at Petit Le Mans. But who could forever forget this one? The race continues. Hi, folks. Lee Diffie back with you, along with Calvin Fish, Chris Neville, Jamie Howe, and Justin Bell. A big thanks to Brian Till for a super job today. And remember the quote, maybe the quote of the weekend, from big Austrian XF1 driver Alexander Wurz. The race begins at the last caution. Have we seen the last caution? There's less than 80 laps to go. Was that it? Or are we yet to see another one and a final scramble to the line? As we get enthralled by this amazing race in this huge weekend, it's appropriate we welcome in the president and CEO of the Pano's Motorsports Group and the American Le Mans Series for his annual visit to the booth, Mr. Scott Atherton. Scott, your jaw, can you pick it up off the ground after seeing this crowd, seeing the weather, seeing the race? Well, I, I said to Don Panos last night, who obviously gets all the credit here for the vision way back when, when this was the impetus of the series, just the single event known as Petit Le Mans. I said, Don, after uh, 13 years, we're going to fulfill the vision, and uh, this has to be it in every measure. We, uh, at the top of the show, we had a little, uh, we had a pre-race show. I know you're probably busy in meetings and, and entertaining VIPs, but I wrote a line at the top of the show and I said, when Dr. Don Paynos dreamt of having a smaller version of the 24 Hours of Le Mans, I wonder if his dream ever looked like this. Do you think he could have even imagined it? He was pretty happy today. Okay. You know, he's, he's a tough guy to please, but uh, walking around, I think it's a combination of everything. It's certainly the crowd. We put that at the top of the list, but the fact that all four championships, manufacturers, drivers, teams, everything up for grabs here. We've moved Petit Le Mans, powered by Mazda 2, back to the season finale status. Blessed with perfect weather conditions. You look at all the corporate hospitalities, all the manufacturer involvement. We've got government officials that are working with us in green racing here. We have literally ticked every box. Just going to get back to the race for a moment. It's still Montagny, Davidson, Alan McNish trying to make up for that lost ground. In fourth overall and in P1, John Field. Simon Pagino, we know that Highcroft has already clinched that P2 show, the prototype championship. They're trying to get their P2 car up onto the overall podium. And the race in GT2 is unbelievable. Magnussen, Bruni, Farnbacher, Cal, this has been just fascinating. It has been sensational, Scott. And looking at this GT battle this year, who would believe that Corvette would come into the final race without a win? I think that's a big statement about the comp competition and the level this year. Yeah, everybody that follows our sport closely expected with their move into this level of GT racing that it was going to be a continuation of the GT1 era. And I think it's a testament, as you say, to the, the depth of the competition and the absolute parity that seems to be in place. We've got four or five different manufacturers here, three different tires, several different types of fuel being used. It's every variable you can throw at it, and yet you can cover them all with a blanket. One of the, uh, we said this is your annual visit to the speed booth. Another annual occasion is the state of the series speech, which you give each and every year here on the Friday before Petit Le Mans. For our, our uh, viewers, what were some of the key points of your address to the media, to the teams, to the sponsors yesterday? Well, we had some interesting uh, research results that we shared with everyone. Uh, our fans, which we know are, you know, towards the higher end of the demographic scale, um, and which is something, again, we're very proud of. They've weathered this economic storm better than most, and uh, we were surprised to see the level of household income still maintained. The biggest news is that we're attracting an even younger audience. The, uh, the, audience, the crowd here this weekend is a full testament to that. I mean, the number of families and high school and college kids that are out here this weekend. At a time when many sports are really suffering, you know, the traditional sports that have lost that youth market to other forms of entertainment, we seem to be one of those that are receiving them. Calvin's lost touch with that youth market, but I'll keep him in touch. <laughs> but um, uh, one, one of the uh, points that you did make, we were there listening to you, another great speech. But one of the other things that you made mention and just weaved in gently was we're always talking about relevance of the American Le Mans series, whether it's down to passenger road cars, whether it's to technology, greening, whatever. The other thing about international relevance of this series, it's now part of the Intercontinental Le Mans Cup. 
Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Yes. <laughs> it really is. Uh, we're very proud to have this event be part of the inaugural season. There's just three events on the list this year. There'll be a total of seven next year, including the Mobile 112 Hours of Sebring. So we'll bookend our season with two Intercontinental Le Mans Cup events. We are and have been supportive of this. It's a very intriguing and exciting new international endurance competition. What we don't want, for obvious reasons, is the success of this new concept to come at the expense of what we have here. And because of the relationship we have with the ACO, I don't think that's a problem. But uh, you know, time will tell, and we're being very careful as we grow with them. Scott, you talk about the green racing, the ALMS series has really been recognized as the leader in that, but you, as you stated quite eloquently yesterday, you've got a two-lap lead and you're not lifting right now. That's exactly right. You know, one of the challenges for anybody in a leadership position is to maintain that and not get comfortable and not lift, as you say. Um, this weekend in particular, we have uh, Margot Oge and uh, Kathleen Hogan from the EPA and the Department of Energy, respectively. Those are the highest ranking officials that are you know, non-politically appointees that uh, the fact that they're here for the whole weekend talking to our manufacturers, they're working with us in the Green Challenge, they'll be at our banquet tomorrow night to make their awards and the future with them is even brighter. We, the, the initiatives that we're working on with them now are really going to wake some people up. We're going to try and cover all bases here so if you don't mind me asking this question and we'll cover the naysayers here uh, this time last year we know about the global financial crisis people not spending like they used to particularly on sports like motorsport numbers were a little bit down you got on the front foot and said right we're introducing a new prototype category and we're going to allow uh, gt3 cup cars whether it be from grand am spec world challenge spec or current year spec to form gtc the naysayers said they're stacking the field they're bringing in just to make the numbers look better do you apologize for that now a year on no apologies uh, it has turned out better than even our highest expectations the lmpc cars have blended into this category uh, and, and really been nothing but complementary to the series they've been exciting they've brought new teams of the highest caliber i mean look at some of the drivers driving the lmpc cars today mark Werner out there right now uh, the gtc cars as you know from last year have been already a good strong addition the fact that we continue to add content you know Jaguar is a new addition this year and during the darkest economic times we announced a brand new two-car Lamborghini team at the state of the series and we also announced Riley coming on board as a prototype manufacturer so at a time when headlines are being made elsewhere for companies leaving manufacturers you know dropping out or reducing we continue to add there's a reason for that this is working Scott, many of the leading American Le Mans series teams like to go to Le Mans in June. And next year, they've announced a test day very early in the schedule. That really makes it difficult for you to schedule around. There's a bit of a gap in the year for the regular teams here who are not going over to France. What are you going to do to help those guys out? It's a big challenge for sure, and it's one of the double-edged swords that come with being connected to Le Mans. Um, this really takes us back a couple of years where that used to be the standard, where teams competing at Le Mans would be required to be there in May for a test weekend and then come back in June for the race. In past recent years, we've eliminated that and it's been one trip just in June. Because of the new regulations for the LMP categories for 2011, the ACO has asked and received the, uh, the approval to have that additional test day. It does present a problem for us for sure because it's a long layoff. Uh, we're looking at some really intriguing ideas though to keep our non Le Mans going teams active, keep the series in the public eye and in the eye of the media. And I would ask everyone to stay tuned on that one. We used to have a nice spring race here at Road Atlanta too. I mean, it's <laughs> just down the road for Lee and I. We wouldn't mind coming up here again, hint, right? Hint, hint. Be careful what you wish for. <laughs> We are watching a pretty thrilling battle going on here, lower down in the order in GT2, but Dirk Werner is really starting to put the pressure on Johnny O. Johnny O'Connell, who had his annual uh, charity auction last night. I don't have a figure on what Johnny O raised, but thanks again for doing that, Johnny. It's for a very, very worthy cause. As we enjoy this racing, Scott, one of the big points of the State of the Series yesterday, new event, and this is not breaking news, but new event on the calendar next year uh, on the streets of Baltimore. That's going to be great. I was there for the formal announcement and I was completely blown away at the, the way the city is already embracing this event. The mayor's office, city manager, the chamber of commerce, 
it was it, the setting is spectacular. It's right in the Inner Harbor. The straightaway is going to go right in front of Camden Yards. This is another shared weekend with IndyCar. Uh, our green racing initiatives that we bring to town have already made headlines there. They have embraced that completely. Uh, I think after the first round, it will become people's favorites. We, uh, I know that you're a regular viewer of the Speed Report each and every Sunday, and a few weeks ago we were very excited to make the news that it looked like Audi was back in the ALMS full-time next year. Unfortunately, we had to uh, do the news last week and say they've decided to switch back on that decision. Uh, I know it's disappointing for you, but how badly does that hurt? Yeah, it's it's difficult to quantify it because, you know, we, we never had it to lose it, right. you know, so to speak. And, of course, it's a big disappointment because, like everyone else, we, uh, we were hearing the same things that you were, and I won't say we were counting on it, but the series has been remarkably successful without Audi. I would never wish them not to be here, that's for sure. Uh, we know that they're committed to the Intercontinental Cup, so we have them twice. Our challenge, my challenge personally, is to expand that into a full season. I don't think it's a question of if, I think it's when. And to look at the other side of that, Scott, I mean, certainly with Audi announcing that they would be coming, there's certainly some of the teams don't want to go up against that, so maybe that makes other people think, you know what, we still want to come and play. A valid point. Um, you know, we were counting on uh, if Audi was going to return, that that in and of itself would be a catalyst to frankly bring other manufacturers to compete at that level. I, uh, I hope you're right, because uh, right now that's going to be the plan for the foreseeable future. But I'm very closely connected both on the German side as well as domestically here, Audi of America. We have a very strong relationship that continues to this day. And uh, I'll just, uh, I got to work a little harder at it, I guess. Uh, we've got 67 to go and it's not even dark here yet. This is hard to believe. What a, even with all these uh, caution periods, uh, it has still been a very quick race today. Scott, anything else? Uh, it's an open table. Anything else you want to get off your chest? Anything else you want to deliver to our viewers and American Le Mans Series fans? Yeah, I'd just like to, uh, to acknowledge the fantastic work that Speed has done this season. It has been a complete pleasure to have you guys part of the ride here. The, the coverage today is just spectacular. The streaming of qualifying, I, I was not able to be here at the time, so I had it up on my computer in the office, and that was remarkable. I think we've fulfilled every expectation and then some. A final word to Jeff Lee and his staff here at Road Atlanta. Uh, I know how hard it is to put on an event like this, and they have done such an outstanding job. Of course, we've been fortunate with the weather, but aside from that, it's gone off like clockwork, and uh, I couldn't be more proud of everybody involved to pull this one off the way it's gone. As we mentioned when we introduced you, you are the president and CEO not only of the series, but also the Pano's Automotive Group, uh, Motorsports Group. We saw today the Abruzzi here. We've seen the road car at Le Mans where it was officially launched to the public, but the first uh, iteration of the race car was here at the circuit today. Can you give us a quick update on that? Yeah, remarkable, remarkable result to have that car even in the paddock. It's a runner. It, uh, it starts up and it drives and it goes around the track. It's certainly not ready to race. Um, it was the most ambitious of tasks under ideal conditions. And like anything in motorsports, it takes longer and costs more than you thought. And uh, we couldn't be more proud of the guys that have been working literally 24-7. A lot of people say that, and it's an exaggeration. In this case, it's fact. And uh, it's a beautiful car. And uh, you will see it very active through the winter with its testing and development program and no doubt at least a couple of them on the grid in Sebring. There he is, folks, CEO, President and CEO of the American Le Mans Series and the Pano's Motorsports Group, Mr. Scott Afford. And no one's worked harder over the last 12 to 18 months and no one ties a double Windsor knot like <laughs> Scott Afford either. Scott, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, guys. There he is, the boss of the series. And he will be watching this with much interest to the end as we go into nighttime twilight. And, you know, many people said, yeah, it was Peugeot on the timesheets last year, Montaigne and Sarazen, when we got washed out. It didn't really count. Tell you what, Cal, they're looking tough to beat now when it does count. They really are. They just made a pit stop, as we saw on screen. No, Pedro Lamy behind the wheel. He was not partnered with Sarazen and Montaigne last year. They just went with a two-driver pairing. But this year, they put Pedro behind the wheel. And he can get the hammer down, down and get the job done as well. Jamie? Well, as we see this, the sun go down and you can really see the headlights on these cars. And talking to the, the GT drivers earlier in the weekend after night practice, they said it's a 
big challenge now because it used to be in the past. First of all, all the GT cars have the yellow tinted lights, all the prototypes, they have the white lights. And in the past, when they saw the white lights behind them, they knew it was an Audi or they knew it was a Peugeot. They knew that they needed to give them room. But however, now with the LMPC cars, they have the same white lights. So when they're coming up behind them when it's dark, they can't tell what kind of car it is. So they don't know how much space to give. So as the sun goes down, it's going to get harder and harder for the GT drivers to tell who's coming up behind them. And traffic could be even worse. Oh, look how close that was as the Peugeot slips up alongside one of those LMPC cars down into 10A. And that was one of the stories that Alex Furtz and Anthony Davidson was telling it, were telling us uh, from a few years ago when Alan McNish was running Christian clean down. He said Christian had no radio. He'd lost his radio communication to the team. He got confused by the lights. He thought it was the sister Peugeot coming by. And instead, it was Alan McNish. Certainly the TV cameras give you kind of a... Uh, you know a different view when we're looking out the window right now Lee it looks a lot darker out there than what we're seeing on screen for these drivers they're having to deal with that and uh, when you make a driver change Lammy just got behind the wheel he's having to adjust to these conditions as opposed to someone like McNish who's been in there for a couple of stints already updating you on GT2 it's still Ferrari with Risi Competizioni's Gia Maria Bruni then Jan Magnussen for Corvette then Dominic Farnbacher for the ESM Oh, we've got a drama on the front straight with one of the Alex Joe Porsches. The 23, another Patron-sponsored car got into trouble there, and it looks like it's come back across the track into traffic. Going again now, but what exactly happened? Again, Dirk Luders behind the wheel. He's raced with the team a couple of times this year already in the long-distance races, but looks like he might have got away with one here in terms of not going full caution period and that will really hurt Audi's hopes so I really think for McNish to climb to the top step of the podium here tonight he needs some help with the caution because the Peugeots are certainly very fast and again 63 laps to go that's all let's take you back and show you see if we can decipher what happened to Luders he's gone way oh, wide yeah way, he gets way, way wide. wide that is a huge catch and very lucky he's now spearing back across the racetrack. Oh my goodness, that is remarkable that no one just clobbered him right there. Watch this. That's when you say go and buy a Powerball ticket. That was extremely fortunate. And that's just the luck of the draw. Watch him, he gets way wide outside that exit curbing in turn 12, loops the car around straight back onto the racetrack. See the rest of the cars hitting the brakes. If one of those prototypes had been whistling through that corner at top speed, that could have been a big one. He did have Patrice Lafargue given the Oak, Oak Racing P2 prototype just on his inside going down through turn 12. I wonder if that kind of balked him or just took his attention away momentarily enough to miss his line and run way out onto the grass. You talk about these GTC cars, they don't develop a lot of downforce, narrow bodied skinnier tires so they don't have a ton of grip and uh, once you get outside that line the racetrack is a little bit dirty off the line they've done a great job of blowing away the marbles throughout the course of this race during the caution periods but still you get outside the groove you're gonna have a problem here is alan mcnish the story is the diminutive scotsman has to get back onto the lead lap he's got to try and get back on that lead lap with 62 laps to go there's only seven and a half seconds separating our first two, Stefan Sarazen and Anthony Davidson. The big story at the top of the show, remember the big ones that count, Sebring Le Mans and Petit Le Mans, it's one all between Audi and Peugeot. This, as far as the big ones are concerned, is the decider. Can this man here pull off another miracle, pull off another amazing Petit Le Mans story? Well, Alan is now back on the lead lap. We saw that Peugeot pit just a few laps ago, so he's back on the lead lap, but essentially the best part of seven-eighths of a lap down on those guys, and he's got to make a pit stop as well here yet. Efficiency and environmental impact coupled with world-class endurance racing provides the perfect competitive platform for the Michelin Green X Challenge, a race within a race, if you like, at all American Le Mans Series events this season. The series is the home for alternative fuels and other green technologies, and you can follow the Michelin Green X Challenge on AmericanLeMans.com.